ways in order to avoid being eaten. For most of them, this is as simple as running away. However, for others, that's really not an option. These animals are known as sedentary or sessile organisms, and many of them are marine organisms which lay attached to the various strata on the sea floor for most of their life cycle. For them, the ominous, horrifying shadow of a hungry fish above them is the surest and simplest sign for danger to which they can react. So therefore, many of them have developed a so-called shadow reflex, whereby when a shadow passes over them, they retreat and withdraw into a place of safety. For example, it's long been known that mussels, clams, or scallops close their uh, shells very tightly when a shadow passes over them. So this is all very nice behaviour. But if we want to know more about uh, how this reflex works on a mechanistic level, what we need to do is to be able to look at the individual components which lead from light detection levels through to an eventual behaviour by the animal. And in things like the scallop, we simply don't have the lab tools, the genetic and molecular tools, capable of doing this. However, in a marine bristle worm known as Platymeraeus dumerili, we do have these tools. And I'd like to introduce you to Platymeraeus dumerili. He's <laughs> <laughs> <It's> very shy. <laughs> So, Platymeraeus de Merrily, the animal which I work on in, in my lab, um, has a silk tube which it attaches itself to the sea floor with, which it makes itself out of silk which is secreted. It has four eyes, here and here, and an array of tentacle-like appendages on its head, <laughs> known as cirri. And when the looming shadow of a fish travels over him, Platymeraeus retreats <laughs> into its tube to safety. You can do that again because I like it. <laughs> I have generated an assay which allows us to quantify this shadow reflex in this animal under different light conditions. For example, under purely green monochromatic light, if I pass a shadow in front of the light source, we see a very strong shadow reflex from Martin here. Very similar to as you would under white light. However, under orange or blue monochromatic light, we see, he sort of shrugs a bit, yeah, um, we see a less strong response. So what this tells us is that the shadow reflex of Platymeraeus has a spectral sensitivity to green light. It is chromatically specific to green light. And we can use this to kind of tell us a bit more about what photoreceptive molecules might be responsible for conducting this response. So when I say photoreceptive molecules, I mean proteins mainly, which are excited by a, molecule, by a photon of light, and then when they become excited, they can pass the signal down through the rest of the organism uh, so that the organism can react accordingly. One such photoreceptive molecule, a photoreceptor protein, is G-O-opsin in platinum rays. <laughs> <laughs> and G-O-opsin, identical to the shadow reflex, has, is maximally excited by green light. So one could imagine that perhaps it's geoopsin in Platymeraeus, which is the photoreceptor responsible for detecting the shadows in the first place. And we can test this because in our lab we have a group of Platymeraeus which lack a functional version of geoopsin. And I can conduct my shadow assay on them. And I find that <laughs> they have a severely diminished shadow reflex. You can have that back. Okay. <laughs> severely diminished shadow reflex. So I can say that geoopsin is required for the shadow reflex in Platymeraeus. However, I want to know more. I want to know where in Platymeraeus is this reflex being conducted from physiologically. And we need merely look where is geoopsin expressed in this organism. So it's a protein dedicated to detecting light. You might imagine, yes, it's probably in the eyes, and you'd be right. There we go, it is four eyes. Lovely. Sorry, Martin. <laughs> Here we are. And you might say, well, yes, obviously, Tom, this, this animal merely sees the shadow and reacts to it accordingly, as we might if we saw a shadow looming over us. And we can test this, because in our lab we also have a method by which to chemically and specifically ablate the eyes and the photoreceptor cells within the eyes of Platyrrhoeus. Once again, I'm very sorry, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> and to do so chemically rather than physically. 
Wonderful. So, with an animal with, an, with its eyes ablated, no longer functional, we can conduct a shadow asset on it again. And we find, oh, he still twitches. He still has a shadow reflex, which must mean that the eyes are not responsible for conducting the shadow reflex in Platinum Reyes. So, where else is? Well, geoopsin is a very strange photoreceptor in that it's not only expressed in the eyes. I've shown that geoopsin is expressed in the brain, with your eyes, <laughs> and also in a few novel and strange domains in the cirri of the animal. <laughs> I made sure we were far enough away from the curtain. <laughs> And, as you may have guessed, in order to test whether these domains are responsible for conducting the shadow reflex, we need to go ahead and surgically remove them as well. <laughs> Under anesthesia. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think our old party here on the He is anesthetised, I assure you. No harm. Wonderful. And we can conduct the shadow reflex on these animals without cirri again. And see, indeed, the shadow reflex has been removed. <laughs> so what that tells us is not just that geoopsin is responsible for conducting the shadow reflex, but more specifically geoopsin in these extraocular regions outside of the eyes in the cirri. And this makes sense if you think about it. If you have want the maximum amount of chance of detecting a shadow, that moves over you as a worm sitting on the bottom of the sea, then you want to have light sensing domains around your peripheries, around your appendages, so that even if the shadow doesn't move directly over your face or eyes, you can still detect it maybe with a stray antennae of some kind. And the fact that these opsins are expressed in this particular place uh, for this particular function can tell us a lot about opsins as well. How they've evolved, and more, specific, more specifically, how opsins and other photoreceptor proteins um, are able to be recruited into other areas of expression, despite the fact they may not necessarily have evolved there in the first place. So with that, I'd like to thank all of you for listening. I'd like to thank Kristen Tesmar for allowing me to do this project in her lab. And I'd especially like to thank Martin for allowing me to degrade him on stage. <laughs>